Welcome to the Unity in Humanity Interfaith Celebration 2022. I'm so thrilled for us all to be able to come together today for this Zoom conference. It is such an easy way for so many people to join in from across the country and even this year from across the world. We gather today to hear speakers from various cultures and religions who are willing to share with us the treasures and the perspectives of their religion and their relationships that they have with divine creator. If you haven't already seen the 2020 Unity in Humanity, um, it is online at restorationarchives.com and also on YouTube. So just a quick reminder, if you can keep the question box for questions only and not comments so that we don't have to weed through to find the questions. Here's a quick rundown of the day. We're going to begin with an opening prayer from our first speaker, Kevin Kicking Woman, and then he will continue with a presentation he's prepared for us all today. Then we will take questions at the end, at the end of each guest speaker. Arkham Rashid will speak second, Joshua Hopping third, then fourth, Gail, and we will end with Denver Snuffer and then close with a prayer from Joshua Hopping. With all that said, I will now introduce Kevin. He joins us from way up in Northern Montana. Kevin Kicking Woman is a tribal member from the Blackfoot Cree Nation in Montana. He served in the Navy for four years based on the USS Sacramento in Bremerton, Washington. He completed three tours overseas and one tour in the Desert Storm conflict. He earned his bachelor degree in Native American Studies and Anthropology, and he graduated from the University of Montana in 2014 with a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies, cultural anthropology, linguistics, and music ethnology. He recently began working at Browning High School as a Blackfoot Native American studies teacher. Kevin has been raised, lives, and practices his Native ceremonies, traditions, singing, and dancing. He's an active member of many Native societies, his passion for singing has brought him respect, acclaim, and knowledge. His singing, sharing, and teaching others has impacted and enriched many lives. Welcome, Kevin. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. I'm very eager to hear you speak. My mom and stepdad live up on the Blackfoot Reservation, and it is really one of the most beautiful places we've ever been. So thank you so much for opening up this dialogue with a prayer. Take it away, Kevin. All right. Okay, Nick Suquex. Nitaniku kuki, nitaya pit since cast him, Kevin. Oh, do do. I'm scappy pit gunny. Miss Duana Coke. Bucket to see a desk skinny march to you. My name is Kevin. My Indian name's Kuki, which means corner, and it's always good to introduce yourself in your tongue. And uh, I come from the uh, southern pit gunny. Uh, the Blackfeet people and the Bikani people. And it's good to be here today in this format and say a prayer and I'll sing a song and start our day out uh, in a good way. So it'll be good. So <clears throat> so here's a prayer in my language and I will uh, interpret it the best I can. Hey, <laughs> Then the Nunix, Kinix, Sistan, and Nunix, Kinaxix, and Nunix. Oxpomos Archimo in the Pitama, Kinoch, Quex, Kinny Dunix. Ixacapi down, Mappy, a bad the piece and a naked skin apin on the chipoxy. I'll kin up in that doozy, six chimatsi, cheap, and Och Chesterquay up is the dookie. Kitsikako me mopo. Nistoatsi mani. Exigimata, see a suk in the cap, yak soxy bad to be up, me so me bad to be sin. O source of life, creator, holy beings, celestial beings, water beings, 
earth beings. Hear us on this day. Help us. Help me. So that we may listen. We may try hard. So we may pity each other. That we may be truthful and spiritual. Help us so we may know our ways. And our languages. Pity us. Pity our children. Bless them. Our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents, our families. Pity our children. They are in need. Help us raise our families correctly. Pray for our language, our languages. Pray for our environment. And pray for this conference that each and every one of us will learn something from each other, all, each other, and most of all, respect one another in our ways that we get to creator in a good way we speak to him that we say hey Well, it's good to be here today. I'm uh, again, I live up here in a little on the reservation of the Amskapi Pikani, the Blackfeet people northwest up here. Um, I have uh, married 32 years and have five children. And one of my last children last night had their senior bat football game, and which was awesome. Um, so, you know, it's good to be and take part in that anyway. But anyway, you know, when we think about our way of life and how we got to be um, where we are today and through our our way we I guess worship I guess in in and um in our beliefs and and how everybody's um different and uh which is good diversity is good and so one of the things that got me to where I'm at is um you know I grew up a in the household of uh through the trauma and stuff that native people went through you know I was kind of part of the I'm a product of that where my mother and father had um uh, uh 15 kids and uh but most of us were in foster homes and and you know how that goes and you know so I went through seven foster homes and one of the foster homes that I would sit and sing and pray all the time and and I can remember one time where um I was actually knocked out by a, the, one of the people foster homes that threw a shoe at me and I went to the floor and I was only nine years old and uh but I got up to my feet and I remember her standing there. She had this real scared look on her face. And but anyway, it looked like something hit me that day. And and, and I remember these words came to me and it said, uh, uh, look into your heart, there's a fire. Don't let it go out. And I thought, wow. I mean, and right then I remember I kind of stretched my spine a little bit and I started singing Indian and a song and um and ever since then, I knew that there was this um, creator out there uh, in, in that way. So I want to talk a little bit about our beliefs as far as the Mskapi Pikani and our our Nitsitapi in our way of life and our Nitsitapi in our language. And I believe that languages are extremely important to us because it is a defining characteristic of who we are as a people. And when you know your language, you... Um, you can really relate to what's out there in the different aspect of seeing the world and the environment. And when you think of Blackfoot way of life, uh, our, and I say Blackfoot because of our Confederacy, you know, and uh, so when I think about that way of life in each of the beasts, and the, um, I put it in the context of how the universe is, uh, is to be open. 
Ishtapatipiope is a word in our Blackfoot language, which means source of life. And source of life, you know, we're DNA with the stars and all that. So when we get up, we believe in renewal. Renewal is big for the um, uh, Blackfeet people and the Blackfoot people. And so when you get up, we renew ourselves every day through our smudge. They call it. And bistak on our tobacco and sapatsimo, our sweet grass. So we get up and we pray. And through Ishtapatapiop, the universe, which is energy, is out there, you know. Um, I love how a student put it, and we did a we were doing a talk, and I told her, I said, Well, what do you what you gain from this reading we did? And she said, You know what? I I I we pray to the universe, whereas uh, whereas other people pray to a god. And it's so true because when you look outside. And, and Niksukwa is a big word in Blackfoot. It means all my relatives. Basically, that is the trees, the rocks, the, the grass, everything outside that has life, energy to it. And so that's what this is about when we talk about spirit. And, and when you think about how Native education was kind of discarded and whatnot, because you, if you couldn't have data or measure it or whatnot in a, in a day of reasoning, um, you know, the gatekeepers of the uh, education system that they disregarded native education. But we knew in our language, that the energy comes in wavelengths and the things you cannot see, perhaps. And, and so that energy is why we pray because our energy, um, we don't believe in particles and things of that nature, but we believe it was wavelengths of energy that would come and help heal you. And, and so on. And uh, so when we took, we get up in the morning, Ishtapatapiop, the universe, Nixuquex, all our relatives, and the Spomita peaks, the above beings, the, the sun, Ukomiki, uh, Sun, Natusi, are married in our way, their husband and wife, the sun and the moon. And we have the Iskichikika uh, mix, uh, the seven brothers, which in the world, other people's world, is the Big Dipper and Mohpakwiks, the lost children, Metleides. And we have Uyis, <clears throat> who is Polaris, that fixed star that in billions of years it's never moved, uh, uh, which we call Uyis, the belly button of the universe. And, and uh, Orion Nebula, Ojiskakatu, oh, see, smoking star, Katuyisix, where he came down, Blood Clot Boy came down and rid this world of evil. And all these star stories that we have. Um, we use uh, uh, in our ceremonies, and a lot of them who our stories come from our ceremonies, uh, bundles and whatnot, our, our sacred idol, who is stunnies, stunnies, is those bundles, they're alive. And that's where they come from, from those star stories, Venus and Mars, uh, Bai and uh, uh, Episuat's morning star. And so then we call upon those above beings to help us meet the peaks. Then we call upon next the sweet the peaks. The uh, water beings, the beaver, shishiki, we got beaver bundles, shishiki, huquiniman, they call it. And we do that ceremony of renewal once a year, too. We renew ourselves. Um, we call upon the fish, the mamiks, the, uh, uh, all of, everything under the water, everything, uh, the otter, emonisi. Um, we call it all these beings to help us in that day when the streams and lakes and oceans and whatnot, everything under those beings of that energy to come help us today. <clears throat> then we call upon that's those beings here on this earth, the human beings, the animals, the, the uh, grass, the trees, the ducks, uh, uh, everything, the birds, you name it, uh, on this earth, the rocks, the mountains, uh, the human beings, and, and all these beings we call upon to help us today uh, of out there, Matuish, the grass and so on, uh, uh, just the trees. And so we call upon that energy, that beings for the day. And the last one we call upon is, is the uh, not to eat the beings, those spirit beings, those holy beings, those ancestors who crossed over to the other side that are now, I guess, a good word, angels and spirit beings uh, um, that, that not to eat the beings that we call upon them to help my mom and dad both passed on. Uh, years ago and, and so I call upon them and all the ancestors who went on to call upon them so when all four of those things come together in Ishtabat to be open and, and creator um, 
all those energy in that day when you get up and renew yourself you call upon those when your smudge is lit in, in your incense of blessing yourself um you call upon that things to help us today and, and so that uh have a good day you know and we find what the word we have for that is called kakyoksen kakyoksen simply means in our language i guess i was talking to an elder and i, I knew it was balanced but he said you know put it in this perspective can you imagine if you grew up acting like a dog or a cat and that's all you knew? Well, that's what you're going to be. He said, well, that's what Gucky Oakson is. He said, it's like what we do when we call upon these beings, we we, we eventually become that, that uh, Gucky Oakson. We find that alignment and that balance. Then through all those things of that, what we just talked about, we call it, then we get through Gucky Oakson, uh, um, what we like to call Matuppi, a human being. And when you can find that human being, then your heart, you're, you're balanced. And, and as you know, like, there's a lot of things that are out of balance today because um, the overtaking and using of this land as a resource and so forth. So um, instead of having subsistence or uh, uh, sustain in this place, uh, this earth, we're kind of taking too much as human beings. And so it's kind of off a little bit so we have to find that balance within ourselves with all this energy in this world <clears throat> so it's really a uh, thing we do when we sing our songs we bring things to life and our songs are very very important because you know when when we um sing songs we bring it to life um there's that reciprocation from the human being to the energy to to the uh the, the sacred item itself to um uh all that energy in a room that brings things to life what i talked about the uh the uh wavelengths and so forth and how we believe the uh how things are coming to life so there's certain songs that are in our way of a black feet way anyway we have thousands of years old that uh, we use but i'll sing a song and in, in, in you know there's place and time for songs you have your sacred primary knowledge songs and you have your uh, secondary songs so if you and when i make sacred primary i refer to that as time and place and so like when we have the first sound of thunder in the blackfeet way of life it is when things come to life because that's when we call each other and say it is our new year now let's start celebrating so we'll call each other not january 1st or december 31st but ours is the first sound of thunder because the grass is turning green, the leaves are coming back, animals are starting to be born, the calves and so forth, and the ducks and our, our birds are starting to return. And so there's just this whole renewal process that we must do with ourselves every day when we smudge and um, every year in, in certain uh, ceremonies that happen every year of renewal. And so it's very intricate the way we as uh, uh, Native people think as far as uh, the environment, uh, your surroundings, your relationships, and so forth. But I'll share a song, some song, a song with you, and, uh, and, and uh, we'll go from there. I'll sing this song. This is um, um, a sweat song. You know, I have about 34, maybe 44 sweat songs. And, um, you, you know, I've got this one from a brother of mine that... Uh, you know, uh, put pity on me. He said, I have a sweat song for you to use. And so I'll sing one of them for you. Those you know, sweats are very powerful. They're kind of just You're entering the womb of Mother Earth. And it's just like a little igloo that's covered completely black inside and a uh, hole dug in the middle where the rocks are outside in the fire pit. And um, the young man usually starts from there to where he'll sit and at the leadership spot, women sit on one side, men sit on the other side. There's four rounds, you rest in between. Um, you go in and uh, you pray and uh, uh, give your whatever's happening to you to the grandfathers, which are all the dopes, the rocks, and the uh, person leading it will help you do that. They'll bring prints in and so forth. And um, a very um, uh, powerful uh, way to help people if you're a leader of those. and. The songs that come through again they bring things to life so that's why songs are so important this is a sweat song <laughs> 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 Oh. 
And so when you think about the way of life of Blackfoot people and the um, interconnectedness, we're interconnected with everything. Um, when you say in Blackfoot, you'd say, Sunny Tapi, how are you doing? But basically you're saying in Sunny uh, Tapi, how are you connected in meaning to the earth? And so that's why when we think of this earth and um, elders, you know, said it best that, um, you know, if your language was connected to this earth, you would respect it more. If it's not connected to this earth, it's going to be used as a resource. And I see that it's so true, you know. And so we as Blackfeet people, you know, you can take time anywhere with you. I was in the military and traveled overseas and whatnot. Time always came with me, but you can't take place with you. And so that's why when we have our ceremonies, we always go home to place our sacred sites, our sacred places, our creation stories, and so forth. So we have to go home and, and um, rejuvenate and renew everything uh, we do in ceremony through songs. And I love what the elder said when we have our talks. We said, well, where are the dinosaurs? And he said, perhaps they didn't do their ceremonies. And so that's why we do ourselves through renewal. We uh, practice those ways um, of getting up in the morning and, and saying our blessings for everybody. And we never pray for ourselves um, in the Blackfeet way. We Other people are supposed to do that for you. And, and so on. Uh, and so how we get our transfers and stuff. So that's what sustained me uh, throughout my life is um, practicing our ways of uh, renewal, um, giving, uh, compassion, empathy, um, and, and just knowing that there are so many ways to get to creator um, and everyone's right the way they want to do it. And that's good, you know, and I think that's what uh, we as Blackfeet people, we believe that everybody has power and it's how they use it is, is on them. And in a Blackfeet way of life, all our ceremonies are about um, good healing, good things. There's nothing bad about them. It's all about goodness and, and what we're praying for and how we do it, Achimoyi, uh, so forth. So um i'll share one more song I, this song you know i uh I make a lot of songs and uh and so i'll sing one of the songs perhaps i made and, and uh i like sharing i do a lot of singing and uh to help people and that's what songs do they help people and the more more songs you more know the more time more you can help people in their way so <clears throat> but this is a thank you song for everything in our ways and one of the other things is that our stories our stories are the same 
every year. Sometimes people have variations. Again, they're an oral tradition that nothing was written. And so one of the stories I can share with you right now is a star story. It's about Scarface and Bayi. And Bayi was a very pitiful man. He had a scar on his face. And uh, there's this uh, beautiful Matsaki that uh, everyone wanted to marry. And she would uh, have nothing to do with anyone. And all the other warriors were making fun of Scarface. So why don't you ask her to marry you? And finally, he cut up the courage and he went and asked her. And she said, since you came and because of your scar on your face, you can feel his humility that I will marry you. But you got to go to the sun. I had a dream about the sun and the sun came to her in a dream and, and that he owned her and had a vow with her. And he said, if you can get this vow removed and visit the sun and as verification, get the scar removed, I will marry you. So he did. He went and asked for help. Give it dot geeks, the elders. Don't get, get the and they helped him uh, all the elders and he went on his way Pemekin and Gai and so forth but anyway as he went and, and, and due to time he asked all these animals all the way and the last animal he asked he was on, oh, just the, the uh, wolverine asked him if he knew where to get to the sun and he was already months into his journey and he said yes you're going to go to um, Sikkim Great sands, the white sands, meaning the ocean. When you get there, he'll be able to get sun. So he did. He traveled and finally got to the sands, but he was tired and he was, uh, you know, he was just wore out and he was laying there and he fell asleep. And all of a sudden, oh, these sacks, big birds, oh, sacks came in. What are you doing? He said, I need to go to the sun. He said, They said, Jump upon our back and we shall take you. And they took off and Put them on their back and they went across and they came to a place, a little island out there above the ocean over the, I mean, and, and they said, if you take this place and you follow this trail, you will make it to the sun. It's called uh, Makui Sokui, meaning the Milky Way, but we call it the Wolf's Trail in Blackfoot. Follow that and you make it, you will go to the sun. So he began his journey. As he was going, there's this guy said, okay, Tsanita, Pisakitaniku, how are you? What is your name? And it was a gentleman he standing there, handsome man. He said, I'm Pai, Nitaniku, Pai Kistu, Nitaniku, Sakitaniku. He said, my name is uh, Ipisuach, Morning Star. He said, well, I come to see not do see the sun. He said, well, that's my father, Ipisuach said. I will take you to see my Ninna, my not do see old man's son. So they went, and of course, Kipataki Kukumi Kusum was there, and the sun was out doing his work. But anyway, they got to visiting, and the sun came back. And he told him, you can stay a few days, but you can't stay any longer now. You know, and so Sun went out next day to do his work. And the moon told those two young people, he said, stay away from a certain area because these big beak birds killed their siblings, uh, Ipisawat siblings, Morning Stars siblings. And so, of course, they didn't listen. They went there. He had somebody to go there with him. He had no fear. But anyway, when those bear birds began to attack, and, but Bayi cut the heads off those big beat birds and saved uh, Hippisuat's morning star. When they went back, they showed him the, what he, he had done and to those birds and had those heads of those birds and as verification. When the son got home, Ukumikisum was uh, told the son of Bayi's deeds. And he said, we will have sweat tomorrow. And when they had sweat that next day, they went four rounds. And... In those four rounds, they rest between each one of those sweat, those rounds. It's pretty. And the Gokumiki, some sat outside. And every time they came outside, she would tell, greet them. And finally, the fourth round, they came out and said, She said, Sa, I'm not a Pisuat. She said, Nitaniku, I'm, I'm Pai. Well, the scar was removed. He looked like her son, beautiful, handsome man. And the son, or I'm sorry, Ipisuat. In, in, but the son was powerful. And he said, since you saved my son, you're going to take these ceremonies back to you people, this sweat lodge. You're also going to take the sun dance that every summer you will pay reverence to us, to the sun. And I will save your people for sickness and good health and stuff when you make your vows to the sun. So in the summertime, we'll have this 
songs and the sun dance every year and this, you can call upon this sweat anytime you need it the sweat lodge to help your help yourself or people who will come to you you also get the sweet grass and the sweet pine and the red ochre paint and, and all the songs that go with it and he said take these back so he went back down to Makwe Sukui and came back into camp they didn't know who he was and uh finally he told the lady the young lady that I am Pai, but I'm now Pachsi Pisuat. I am mistaken morning star because when the moon was looking, he said, this is what I brought back. These are the ceremonies that we should practice every year. And that is why they got married and lived ever happy ever after. But that is why we do this summer sun dance in the summer. And when you look to the east, you'll see two planets, Venus and Mars, Pisuat and Bakhsi uh, Pisuats are by a mistaken morning star who is Mars. And, and those are those two planets of that story. And the kids, I tell them the, the, the morality of the story is about never give up because Scarface never get up, gave up. And we all have a Scarface story in our ways of life of uh, what us triumphing and never giving up. So with all that good luck, I, I, we are circumstance of luck, we believe. But, and, and so... I give you my luck today through the stories I have told you and uh, have a little time for questioning. So if you have any questions, feel free uh, to ask. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. It's a good thing we're doing. Uh, Thank you. you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so no questions have come up in the question box yet. So if you have any, go ahead and put them in. But I did want to say um, that I love the story of Scarface. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's probably one of my favorites. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I appreciate you um, mentioning sweats and explaining what a sweat is for those that don't know what sweat lodges are. Um, you did mention smudging. Do you want to explain what, what your smudging looks like um, every day for those that don't know about uh, how to smudge? You no, know, and we have these smudge boxes that we keep. I don't have one here, but by my bedside. And I also keep one at school where I work, so kids have it. But, you know, it's a little wooden box that is made. And they have bear, our bear, our Misinski, badger dirt we use. And uh, and so we take that badger dirt, we put it in there, then we light our coals. Then we put sopatsi, you know, the braided sweetgrass, in there with katoyes, uh, sweet pine, uh, if you want to use that too. You know, it's the only two we use as blackfeeds. Some people use sage, other things, but and this is what I told we use. But anyway, we take that smudge and it's purification. You're cleaning your body. You you, you take it. And when I smudge, I always uh, touch my, my ears first that I listen good today. Then I touch my mouth that I say the right things today. My mind that I think good today. And then I go four times over my body each side with that smoke touching it. And each time then I touch my heart at the end. Uh, um, and for the purification that things go good today, that I think good today, that I do well today and pray for people. And I also pray that um, if there's any animosity toward me, that um, pray for them uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so that's what it is. It's a purification process to start your day out in, um, in good ways. So I do it in the morning and then at night, uh, take an inventory of your life, what you did, what you humble, did you laugh, did you cry? And uh, um, uh, was you generous those four things in a day when you lived a good day your day was good all right thank you we do have a question but I have one more first um, can you tell us about your name Kevin I know I had someone reach out and Aki. ask about how you come to the name Kevin Kicking Woman Aki Suikaksin literally means old lady with long legs or old lady stretching her legs and so Kicking Woman came back and when they were taking senses of the Blackfeet people uh, back in the 1700s around there. Well, they took the oldest person from the households or the back then, the Neat Deweyus, the Lodge, and we we're doing census. And the, it was my great, great, great grandmother that Akisui got sent old lady with long legs. And so the government said, well, we can, you know, you know, it's too long to write or whatever they, their decision was. They're the ones who gave us Kicking Woman. So that's how that name came about, um, Kicking Woman. Aki, but my, I just say that Smith or Jones, my Indian name is Gugi, corner post. I took my grandpa in those wagon days in 1904 
and he was born in, at a corner of a fence in 1904. So they called him Kuki, that corner post. It's a strong name, like it holds up, it's at that corner. Excellent, thank you. And then I'm gonna read to you the question that came in. It says, you mentioned Venus and Mars being important to your traditions. Those planets are also important to nearly all ancient cultures. In addition, the planet Saturn is a central figure in those cultures. Does Saturn figure in your central tradition, in your cultural tradition, excuse me? If so, how? No, I have never heard anything about Saturn. Um, not to say that I don't, because <clears throat> again, you know, we're just like the little dot in this uh, of what we know. There's so much to learn. In, uh, but I've never heard Saturn. Um, not to say there isn't, but I've never heard anything. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'll give it just a minute for any other questions to come in. Kevin, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking today. I really appreciate it. I love the singing. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Oh, you bet. It's important. So um, our next speaker today is Arkham Rashid. Welcome, Arkham. And thank you so much for coming to speak today. Uh, Arkham is a resident scholar and imam at the Islamic Society of Delaware. He serves as the director for Rewak Institute, which is a nonprofit Islamic education organization. He is a graduate of Al Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, with a degree in Islamic law. He's also a graduate of the Delaware Law School in Wilmington, Delaware, with a JD. He is a trial attorney who was born in Pennsylvania and currently resides in Delaware. He has memorized the whole Quran. I had a chance to hear him talk as part of an interfaith panel of speakers earlier this month for Delaware Peace Week. It was an excellent dialogue to be a part of, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing him speak again today. Welcome, Arkham. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon uh, from where I am, and good morning to people who are joining from different time zones. I don't know if anyone's joining from a time zone that is uh, later than ours, but if they are, good evening to you. Um, I want to begin by um, thanking the host for putting this together. Uh, thank you for inviting me as well and, and allowing me to be a part of this great conversation. Um, and then I want to begin also by uh, the Islamic greeting or the Muslim greeting, which is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Um, Assalamu Alaikum, it means may peace be upon you. Um, and what I will talk about is the, the concept of uh, peace within the Islamic tradition. So I'll begin with this very phrase that we greet one another with, which is assalamu alaikum. The first word, assalam, means peace. Alaikum means upon you. Um, salam and its uh, Hebrew equivalent, which is uh, shalom, uh, they mean the same thing, peace. And in Arabic, salam, is similar to the, the name of the religion, which is Islam. So you have these two words. You have the word salam, and it shares certain letters. In Arabic, it has the seen, which is the sa sound, the lam, which is the L sound, the la, and the meme, the salam at the end. These three letters are the root words or the root letters for the word salam, the word that means peace. They are the same root letters for the name of the religion, which is Islam. And Islam, Salam, Islam, Salam, they sound very similar. Um, that's because they, as we said, come from that original root word or root letters, which means peace. When Muslims greet one another, we greet each other with peace be upon you. The word for the religion, though, doesn't mean peace. And if I'm speaking a little too quick for people, just let me know. I uh, just wanted to give you guys more time for your Q&A, so I'm trying to condense my portion of this. Um, so when the, the name of the religion itself means submission, submission to God, um, that's Islam. So Islam, submission, salam, peace. They both come from that root word, salama, which means peace, serenity, calmness, tranquility. 
Um, and the reason or the connection that is there is that through submission to God, Muslims believe that through the submission to God, a person attains peace. And that true peace is only attained when we find that submission to God, when we find ourselves in submission to God. And that peace is in two ways. There is a worldly peace that is attained when a person um, does not kill, does not harm another, does not steal, right? When we refrain from these actions that bring about harm to other people, when society lives in that way, there's a peace that is established in that society. And more importantly, there is a spiritual peace that comes with it. Through submission to God, a person attains true peace, right? True salam. A person who does Islam, a person who acts upon the submission is called a Muslim. So Muslim is someone who does Islam, which is submits. So a Muslim essentially equals somebody who submits to God. So now we have three words we're working with. We have uh, the word salam, which means peace itself. And it's used in the phrase, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. We have the word Islam, which is the name of the religion, which means submission. And it comes from that root word of peace. And then now we have this third working word, which is Muslim, someone who does Islam, uh, meaning somebody who does submission or submits to God, and they're called a Muslim, someone who submits to God. So we have these three words. Then we have the concept of uh, peace or salam. In a general sense, I'll share some of the tradition that is there. We, in the Islamic tradition, God has 99 names. It's the same entity, but 99 names that highlight the attributes of God. So um, God's name, which is constantly said um, in, in this phrase, before we do anything, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Together it's Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And this means in the name of God, be ism Allah, with name Allah. Allah is the name of God in the Arabic language. So when we translate Allah into English, it is God with a capital G. We believe the entity that, um, for instance, in the Christian tradition is referred to as father, we believe that entity is called Allah in the, in the Arabic language and in the Islamic tradition. We don't believe that people worship different entities. We believe that entity is God. There is only one entity that we believe in that power, that entity is called Allah in Arabic. And sometimes from the Islamic framework, um, for example, the difference between Christianity and Islam is we don't believe that entity has a son. We don't believe that anything can be associated with that entity. So we believe that entity is an absolute power um, and that there is no other God but God. And that's the, the common phrase that is said. So God or Allah has 99 names and these highlight the attributes of God. Two of the names I mentioned in the phrase that I did be ism Allah, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate, right? Um, these are two names of God. So you can call upon God as Ya Rahman, O oh, the most merciful. Ya Rahim, O oh, the most compassionate. Um, uh, ya um, uh, ya uh, Malik, right? O oh, the Lord of everything. Um, ya Quddus, the one that is the most uh, sacred. Right? These are different names of God. One of the 99 names that we have is Ya Salam or As Salam. And As Salam, as the word that we already did, means peace. So we believe God is the source of peace, that God Himself is peace and He is the source of peace. And there's a uh, prayer that we have, um, a, a, a statement that we say, and this is usually said after each ritualistic act of prayer. So in the Islamic tradition, we have two types of what in the English language is called prayer, but in Arabic, it's called sada, one of the types, and dua, one of the types. But both translate to prayer uh, into the English language. One is the ritualistic style of prayer that some of you might have seen, uh, either in pictures or on TV, where a person is standing, bowing, prostrating, doing different uh, actions. These actions together in a specific way 
accompanied by certain recitation are called or constitute a single prayer. Um, that is the salah in Arabic. Then you have dua, which is a prayer of statement. When a person requests something from God, when a person praises God uh, simply in in a uh, 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 in a verbal manner, right? All praises to God. Um, and then you ask God for different things that you want. Oh, God, grant me strength, grant me the ability to do this, grant me a new home, a new car, whatever that you are praying to God for. That is also a dua. That is also a type of prayer. Now, after the ritualistic prayer, the one with the different positions and, and uh, actions, we make verbal prayers. And in those verbal prayers, one of the prophetic prayers that is there is um, is this dua, is this prayer that is Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. So notice the, the word salam is there again, right? And you're saying, oh Allah, oh God, anta salam, you are a salam, you are peace. That's, that's the literal translation of it. Oh God, you are a salam, wa minka salam, from you comes all peace. Right, so this is an essential component of the Islamic tradition, and, and that's why the nickname for the Islamic religion um, is the religion of peace. That's where it comes from. That the name of the religion originates from peace, and there is this important component of peace that is surrounded the the essentials of the 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 religion, and that after every ritualistic act of prayer, which is done at minimum five times a day for believers. That believers throughout the day, they pray five times every single day, the specific ritualistic acts, which are the different positions, starting as early as, you know, five in the morning, six in the morning, depending on the time of the year, um, sometimes four in the morning, depending on the time of the year. So they wake up, they pray, and sometimes they go back to sleep, sometimes they stay awake, then in the afternoon, then uh, late afternoon, then at sunset, um, then at uh, in the evening or at night, they make a prayer as well. After every one of these prayers, the prophetic tradition was to recite this prayer, that, oh God, you are peace and you are the source of peace, to remind um, each believer about the commitment we are to have as believers to the concept of peace. Um, so what I'll do is... Um, I will conclude with these remarks and I will engage in conversation with you. And if there's no questions, I have a few other things to say, but I'd rather um, have conversation about the, the topics that you're interested in or that these different statements might have prompted in your minds. Um, so I'll open the floor up. Thank you, Arkham. I have one that has come in. Um, the two actually now, it looks like the first one is, what is the significance of Kaaba? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yep, that's correct. So we'll start with that. The The Kaaba is one of the, the, or not one of the, because it's not equivalent to all of them, but it is the greatest mosque on earth. So the, the Kaaba, which is the name of the mosque that is in modern day, uh, Saudi Arabia in the city of Mecca. Some of you have, might have seen it. It looks like a, a black box. So that is a, a mosque. And that is the, the main mosque of, of Muslims. So that is, we believe that is the, the highest uh, mosque of importance in the Islamic tradition. Um, the direction of prayer is praying towards that direction. So in the, I'm actually sitting in a mosque right now in uh, Dover, Delaware. And our prayer area faces the direction of where the Kaaba is located. So the Kaaba itself is, is a, it's a location where the, the mosque that is there is present. Um, that mosque, we believe, was built from the beginning of time and then reconstructed over time as well. Um, but the, the last major in, in our tradition is that it was constructed by Prophet Abraham. So that's what the Islamic tradition believes, that Prophet Abraham and his son constructed that mosque. And in front of that mosque or that the, the um, black square that you have, there's this area where the footprint of Prophet Abraham is there. So it's a um, protected kind of area. And there's this 
stone kind of thing where there's a footprint and it's said to be the footprint of Prophet Abraham. Um, so that, that's what the Kaaba is. It's a specific mosque of the most important. Um, there's three very important mosques in the tradition. Um, the Kaaba is the first. Then you have the mosque in the city of Medina, which is the city of the Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. Um, that is in modern day Medina, Saudi Arabia. And then you have the third uh, mosque, which is uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa or the Aqsa Mosque, which is in modern day Jerusalem. Um, so those three are of very importance in the Islamic tradition. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. All right, here's another one. Um, do you believe that God is knowable? Um, if if I understand knowable, like can we know God, am I assuming? or um, that's, so, that's probably what I would say, yes. Okay. Um, so yes, in a sense, um, we can't grasp the what god is so for example we in the islamic tradition we don't believe god is made up of what he created um, we believe time is created space is created space as in the space that we take up matter is created um, so all of these creations of god cannot encompass god um we um in one of the verses of the Quran, God says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing that is likened to God, or there is nothing that is like God. And that tells us that anything that we can imagine that God is like this or God is like that, that's not what God is, because that's something we can imagine, meaning it's something that is created. We can only imagine things that are created, even if it doesn't exist as a specific thing. We can only put together pieces and create something in our mind of things that are created. Um, but God is not something that is created. Um, God is something that always is. It's, an, it's, a, it's a necessary being that God always is. God always was. Um, and there's descriptions of God that we know through revelation. So God is the most merciful. Um, God tells us in the Islamic tradition that his mercy overcomes his wrath or his anger. Um, that God's mercy is greater than any wrath that God has. Um, we know God is the most just. We have these descriptions of God in, in the sense of his qualities or attributes. Um, but our knowledge about God is limited in that sense in the Islamic tradition. Um, if you notice, if you ever go into a mosque, there will, or let's put it this way, there isn't a single mosque on earth that will depict God. There just isn't. It's not in the Islamic tradition. There is no depiction of God. Um, there's mosques that would have Arabic words that describe the qualities of God, but that it, there is no actual depiction of God. Um, I hope in a general sense that answered your question as well. Thank you. All right. Um, next one, it says the Jewish and Christian traditions look forward to a time of peace and harmony united by devotion and submission to God. Your discussion of peace and submission, submission to God sounds parallel is there an islamic tradition of an end time transition from bitterness to peace okay um so actually let me i'm reading the question as well because i think there's multiple parts to this um harmony united by devotion yeah so so the islamic tradition actually and and whether the obviously there's going to be uh, Christian traditions and Jewish traditions that don't agree with this, um, similar to how the Christian tradition, um, in a sense, and I know there's um, different denominations, um, sees itself as a continuation of God's message. So you have the the um, um, the Torah, which is the the um, uh, the Old Testament. There you go. So the Old Testament and the New Testament, meaning they believe that this was God's message. The Islamic tradition also views itself as a continuation of God's message, meaning in order for a person to be a Muslim, they have to affirm their faith in the previous prophets and the previous books that were sent. So a Muslim is somebody who affirms their faith in uh, the Bible and in the Torah. So Muslims believe in the Bible Torah. Now, there is a, a, a difference here or a nuance. The Muslims or the Islamic tradition does not believe that the Bible or the Torah are still in their original form. But 
a Muslim has to believe that the Bible was a revelation of God, that the Torah was a revelation of God, and that the Torah was sent to Prophet Moses, who was a prophet of God, and the Bible was sent to Prophet Jesus, who was a prophet of God. That's the Islamic tradition, that there has been from the beginning of time various messengers of God and various messages from God. And these messages, we don't believe, remain in their original form but they were at a point in time from God and they were divine. They weren't created by human beings. Um, so in that sense, the, the, and that's why there's a lot of um, similarities or parallels that are there. And it's, it's in that um, framework of Abrahamic faiths or Abrahamic religions. Um, in, in Western academia of religion, um, for some reason, it's, it, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam are considered uh, Western religions, although all three of them are quote unquote, founded in, in the Middle East area, um, but they're classified in the Western Academy as Western religions, um, as opposed to other traditions that are there that are classified as Eastern religions, if we can uh, use those uh, bin or that binary that is there. Um, is there an Islamic tradition end of time? So the end of time tradition in the Islamic tradition is that um, at the end, everything will come to an end. So we believe that there will be a final day. And upon that final day, nothing will survive, including all creations of God, um, including the angels, including any creation of God, except for God. So everything uh, shall cease to exist except God. And then God will resurrect everything. So we believe in resurrection, that everything will be resurrected by God. And everything will be resurrected, according to the mainstream Islamic opinion, in its physical sense. So every human will be resurrected. And then the day of judgment shall take place, where God then judges people for everything that they have done in this world, good and bad, and we will be accountable um, for everything that we have done. So if we harm someone, we get away with it in this life, we believe that on the day of judgment, we are responsible and accountable for that. Um, okay. There's a lot of questions in there. Arkham, do you want to do you want to go through? It looks like you have about 12 minutes if you want to want to pick and choose or do you want to hit them one at a sure. time? Let me I'll just look at um let me see what's the left. I'll try to go in order. Um, let me see where we were. Um, what is the what is the connection between mankind and Allah or God? And why are we here in this mortal experience? Um, so the connection uh, in a general sense between God and Allah is that we are the creation of God. Um, we don't believe that we're part of God. So we're not divine in any sense. Uh, we are uh, creations, uh, a creation of God that God created. Now, we do believe that human beings um, are, a, in a certain sense, if I, if I can use this in a way not to imply that other creations don't have this, we believe that we are dignified in a certain sense. So we believe human beings are more dignified than other creation of God, or that there's a, a, a preference of God that is given. Um, now, this is present in other religious traditions, such as Christianity has a concept of this as well, and other traditions do not have this concept. Um, they believe in an equality of all creation in a, in a, in a general sense. Um, however, we believe that human beings are placed upon earth as the caretakers of earth, that we are um, given the benefits of the creation that is around us. So God created, you know, uh, vegetation, plants, animals, whatever it may be for the benefit of humanity, but not um, for the, the, the purpose of human beings um, uh, kind of taking advantage of them, but rather as caretakers. So they're there for the benefit of humanity. So we eat from the earth, we eat from what God has created, but it's not there for our advantage to oppress, right? And that, that goes into oppressing other creation of God. Um, but we are here as caretakers of the creation that God has created in that special preference that, that is present in the Islamic understanding. Um, there's an explicit verse in the Quran where God says, verily, we have dignified the, the children of Adam, which refers to the human race. Um, 
All right. Um, what are what major religious ceremonies do you perform? For example, Christians promote baptism, remission for sins. Any? Um, so we 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 do Friday services, which is similar to the the Christian uh, Sunday service, um, where we have a sermon and then prayers. Um, we have daily prayers as well. People can pray at home, or they can come to the mosque and pray. Um, we don't have a concept of of baptism, but we do have um, the shahada. So when somebody becomes a Muslim, when somebody becomes um, a a uh, believer or converts or reverts, whichever of the words uh, people use uh, to the religion of Islam, they utter the shahada, which means there is no God except God or God with a capital G uh, or Allah. There is no God but Allah. And the Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger and servant of God. So the Prophet Muhammad is not understood as a divine being in the Islamic tradition, rather one of the uh, various prophets that were sent by God. Um, and he is a human being. He is not a divine uh, related being to God. Um, that enters the person into the faith. That doesn't need to be a public thing. They can say it at, at home and group of friends or around some people. Um, but usually people like to come to the mosque and do it in front of the, the congregation. Um, so we do that as well. Um, we don't do any any sort of confessions or anything of that sort. Um, we believe your sins are between you and God. Um, people should repent for their sins. If their sins had a worldly effect, they need to rectify that worldly effect. So if somebody stole a hundred dollars from somebody, they got to repent to God and also ask forgiveness from that person and make that person whole again. Um, all right, I'll move to the next question. Just let me know when my, my time is almost up when I have two minutes, because I'll keep going until it's the next person's time. I should have took a shorter time than I did <laughs> based on the amount of questions. Uh, I'd like to better understand the importance of interpreting the Quran to the lens of the Prophet Muhammad teaching the Arabic and transmission problems. Okay. So that is a very, um, I don't know if everyone can see the questions. In that case, I'll read it out loud. Um, I'd like to better understand the importance of interpreting the Quran through the lens of the Prophet Muhammad's teachings and how accurate or faithful, in your opinion, has been the transmission of Muhammad's teachings over time. Um, so that's a two-part question. The first part is the importance of interpreting the Quran through the lens of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, in the interpretation of the Quran, we believe that there's a methodology that has to be used. The, in a general sense, the methodology is this. Step one is interpreting the Quran through the Quran. So if we're trying to understand one verse and there's a clarification in another portion of the Quran, that clarification would be applied to this verse. So interpreting the Quran through the Quran. The second step is interpreting the Quran through the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and that allows us to understand how the Quran is to be or ought to be understood. Um, the third is then the companions who were around the Prophet Muhammad. And then after that, it goes into major scholars and experts in the Quran. Um, the reason why that is important is because it removes any uh, uh, possibility of misconstruing verses of the Quran. So somebody might take, and this is um, this can be done with pretty much any religious tradition that or religious scripture that you can take it and interpret it in a peaceful way or a non-peaceful way. Um, and when people create their own interpretations and bypass a, a tradition that is there, um, and in the case of the Islamic tradition, there's 1,400 years of, of how interpretation works. Um, you kind of bypass that tradition to get what you want from the book. And that can be dangerous. Sometimes it can be beneficial uh, to certain people if they use it in a beneficial way. I mean, I guess beneficial would be how you understand it to be if you have an evil intent. And what is beneficial towards you might be something evil. Um, but in a sense, people use it to create their own understanding and their own goal or outcome from it. Um, and that's one of the dangers of bypassing that tradition that is there. Um, if that tradition is barring you from doing that, so from saying, oh, I'm going to understand this verse and this because this is what I want to do, but that tradition stands in your way, that's where people don't like it. They'll bypass it or try to bypass it. 
Um, mainstream Islamic scholarship has always held that this is the method of doing it, that it can't be, you can't just take the verse and understand it however you want to understand it. Um, it has to be within a framework. Now, it is open to interpretation, meaning it can be applied to situations. So there's a certain situation that is here. And to give you a very, very basic example, the Quran prohibits drinking of alcohol. Alcohol is prohibited because it's something that intoxicates. Um, that verse, that ruling is applied to the use of cocaine, for example. In the Islamic tradition, cocaine is not permissible to use because it has effects on the brain that uh, intoxicates or removes the capability of um, controlling your actions. Um, in, in some cases, um, you know, there's nothing explicit mentioned in the Quran, but that verse is then applied. So in, in, in those cases within the framework, you can apply um, Quranic verses to it. Then the second part of that question, which is how accurate or faithful in your opinion has the transmissions been? Um, so the transmissions are then divided into various modes or various types. Not all transmissions from the Prophet Muhammad are of the same grading or the same level. Um, we have transmissions which are mass transmitted and sound in their chains of transmission. Those are uh, accurate. According to mainstream Islamic belief, those are considered uh, accurate transmissions. Then you have transmissions which are sound in their transmissions, but not as massly transmitted. That is still considered sound for interpretation, for use as a, um, a secondary source in the Islamic tradition, or use as a... Um, general source depending on what what is being established in the tradition um, and then you have transmissions that are considered weak and they're only allowed to be used in certain cases so for example if the prophetic tradition encourages something that is generally a good deed a good act it's considered permissible to use so we have various traditions that encourage um, feeding the poor taking care of the orphan even if they're weak in their transmission Right? It's permissible to use because the, the goal of the transmission, the message of it, falls within the, the teachings of the Islamic framework. Um, so then it would be permissible to use. However, if a weak transmission tries to establish a practice that is not found. So if the practice says, let's go stand in the sun um, for two hours to worship God, that is not a practice that is found in the Islamic tradition. A weak transmitted Hadith, what's known as a prophetic transmission, would not be able to establish that practice. Okay. Um, Arkham. <clears throat> is my we time up? We hit our deadline, but it, it gets me to thinking there are a lot of questions here that haven't been able to be answered. So um, any chance you would be willing to leave an email um, or announce an email for people to send their questions to directly? Um, so what I can so email is going to be difficult because these questions are, are like long essays that I have to write out. Um, so I don't want to make any promises. But what I can do is I can set up a time for an hour block of Q&A and I'll send you the link and you can just send it to everyone. So whoever's interested in joining that, I'll just do Q&A during that time. That would be excellent. Thank you so much for offering that. Of course. No problem. OK, thank you so for having me here. Coming. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. I just, I really appreciate you coming and sharing with us today and taking those questions. Um, before we go to the next speaker, I did get a question that rolled in for Kevin Kicking Woman, and I wanted to get run that by him real quick. Kevin, the, the question says, I have a question for Kevin Kicking Woman with long legs. Do you honor any of the traditions of the great white healer that came uh, among your people two millennia ago? Um, that's a good question. Um, of course, you know, with the uh, the atrocities that happened with Native people, and just to be frank and blunt, I remember when I was at a thing with, uh, uh, I was a symposium of leaders and whatnot. We were talking to, again, we always talk to our elders. And I fought with this question all my life because going through seven foster homes and because of the boarding school era of what happened to Native children and, and my grand, my dad and mom of the mental, physical, sexual, emotional abuse that these churches have done. Um, I used to, I'm going to say for, for myself, used to 
uh, believe in Christianity. When I decided that I'm a speaker of my language and the, of songs and whatnot, and I understand their ways, and when an elder got up and said something that just really poignant to me, he said, we as Native people never killed in the name of Jesus. They said they had a powerful God that was used in a wrong way against us. That hit me hard. And I do not practice those ways. A lot of Natives do because of the indoctrination of the uh, 1452 52 papal um, doctrine of discovery that um, enslaved a lot of uh, other people and came into the Americas. And so myself is that I believe in our Native ways that we've been here since the beginning of time. And our ways was always, always was to respect other ways because they had power. We didn't have that boast to boast about who we were as far as my power is bit more than yours and so on that we could kill um, because our ways were stronger. It wasn't about that. Ours was about boundaries and other things that, um, but it was never about whose God was better or that or anything of that nature. And so what was brought to the Americas um, is, is, doesn't sit well with me. And so I do not practice um, anything. I do, we do do Christmas, but I mine is only just for um, giving, doing th good things for each other and so forth. Um, I practice my ways um, and that's who I am. I'm the Tsitipi, I'm Scopi Pikani. I'm a real person and I'm a Blackfeet uh, man. Um, and uh, that's what I do. And there's a lot of other natives that are indoctrinized in Catholicism and Pentecostal and all these other uh, uh, religions. And we don't even refer to our way of life as religion. It is not a religion. Our way of life is Michita Bisani in our language. It's a way of life. It's every day. It's just not on Sunday. So that's just my answer I can give you. Um, um, and that's what I tell my kids that. And I also tell my kids, you choose what you want because everybody has power. But I'm Blackfeet, and that's all I can say. I need to, to be a real person. So I hope that answers your question. That does. Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate you staying on for another one. All right. Next, we're going to move on to Joshua S. Hopping. Joshua is a Cherokee Nation tribal member of Celtic Cherokee Heritage, currently residing in Idaho. Uh, the traditional land of the Shoshone and Bannock tribes, people who are still with us today. He's a passionate follower of the creator with a love for all life, human and non-human. He considers himself a Christian mystic who embraces the mystery of knowing and non-knowing while journeying daily along the way of the historical Jesus of Nazareth. He is the author of The Mystery, The Way, and The Journey, Walking into the Darkness of the Unknown. I'm very excited to have Joshua as one of my speakers today. I'm interested to hear what he has prepared. Welcome, Joshua. Oh, Shio, thank you so much for allowing me to come. Um, I don't know if we could share screens or not. I did have um, Yes, a... you should be able to share screen. It says it's disabled. Uh-oh. Brent, can you take a look at that? So... Yeah, why they why they figured that part out? Um, if it's not a big deal, if not, um, but I did have some quotes and stuff doing it. So I, before we get started, um, thank you, Jill, for that uh, introduction and for everybody else who's spoken beforehand. Um, I do appreciate it. It's been a lot of learning. Um, you know, even what uh, Kevin um, mentioned beforehand, it definitely is. As an indigenous person, it definitely is a struggle. Um, I have. Uh, yeah, it's definitely interesting, put it that way. But let me share you a little bit more about who I am. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, you know, American European culture tends to focus on what we do. Um, I really want to kind of share a little bit about who I am, because I think the the message is connected with the messenger. Um, I don't think it's you're not able just to share uh, facts and figures or logic without actually knowing the people who's actually speaking. So in a lot of ways, the message that I share about the creator is intertwined with my life, my journey, my family, my non-human uh, relatives, you know, the rocks, trees, animals, everything around me is intertied into this message. So I'd be able to share a little bit um, about that to be able to understand what I will share. 
So um, with that, you know, as Jill mentioned, I am a pastor and follower of the creator with love of all life. Um, really, I kind of emphasize the human and non-human. Um, it's been kind of the last so much of time we tend to focus on just our human relatives. And it's like we really do have to realize that we are interconnected with all you know, everything, you know, the rocks, the trees, life, plants, it's like we're all part of this life deal. Uh, I am a Cherokee Nation tribal member, um, deep roots into uh, the Cherokee Reservation down in Adair County on Mission Mountain area, uh, connected with the Langley family, if you are anybody from the Cherokee, that area. Um, my family is a multi-ethnic family. Um, as you see, you know, my skin's a little white, so we've intermarried in with some of the English and the Scottish and Germans and such. We have African-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Hispanics, there's Crow, there's South Koreans, all within my extended family, um, because humans are humans, and we will sometimes find uh, mates a lot of places, um, which actually then helps us to share in here from the various traditions of those ethnicities that kind of build pulled together, even though we're trying to keep um, our own as well alive. As I said, um, I had a picture, again, it's kind of not working, but I wasn't share a picture of my, my lovely bride. I've been married for 22 years and I have three um, wonderful boys, uh, 12, uh, seven and four, which keeps me going. And then I have my non-human, um, my animal relatives. I have like six chickens and a dog, and we have a garden that we grow. We try to kind of live in union uh, with each other, which is also part of coming in. And, you know, though I grew up in the Cherokee and even on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma, I have been living in Idaho, which is the land of the Shoshone and the Bannock people, uh, which has been a really good sojourn out here for the last 20 years. Now. Again, as part of my life, I've had my my work life, my professional life has been in the online brand protection world, doing anti-counterfeiting and trademark abuse. But I've also served as a pastor and a church planner, and I've also served, uh, been an author. Um, as Jill said, I've published um, a few books, most notably The Mystery, The Way, and The Journey, Walking into the Darkness Unknown. So that's a little Joshua, bit. It looks like maybe it looks like you should be able to share now. You want to give it a try? I will. Oh, excellent. Perfect. See if that comes through. Can you all Sorry see the that. screen? Is yep, my screen good. coming through? Perfect. All right. Well, I will skip ahead a little bit on this one. You can see my wife. I usually show my pictures of my kids, but they're not around. This is the land of the Shoshone Bannock people in Idaho. This really touches my heart. Some of the books, but the keeping in with time. Um, I really want to talk a little bit about the land of my youth. You know, when you grow up, the land speaks to you. The land will actually help you understand how you relate to the creator. Um, there's something that's actually in there. And when I grew up in um, kind of the foothills of Ozarks, um, there on the Cherokee Res, there, the Ozark Mountains, I'd say, always say, are kind of their old mountain. They're rounded with age. There's like little hollers and there's trees and there's vegetation and there's all this thing all around you when you're coming. And if something falls to the ground uh, within three years, you know, it become dirt and it comes into it. In fact, this right here, uh, this is my great grandfather had built this barn and it was considered the new barn when I was growing up. Um, and as you see over the last, you know, 15, 20 years has grown up and it's like that's the way of the land you're growing up with it. Now, I, as I think about that, I actually think that a lot of times in America, Christianity kind of gets into that because, you know, I've talked about myself being a Christian mystic. And I think sometimes Christianity in America is like it's like the overgrown with all of these trees and all this stuff around us that we just kind of like, okay, you know, it's there without actually taking a look at it. When I was a child in Oklahoma, I would look at the rocks and there's these, these fossils in the rocks, the limestone. And I spent hours looking at there, kind of staying there. And it's like, it's digging back under the thing to look under the surface. And when I say that, I actually, I think Oliver Clement says it's great. He says, not only Christianity is something strange to people today, but it cannot even attract by the strangeness because people are familiar with the dissertations and characteristics of it, which are constantly being hawked around. You know, it is painful. I think Kevin shared about the abuses of, of the boarding school and stuff. And that is a huge pain. And there's days that I don't want to even be considered a Christian because of the abuses to my own family, my own people that happens. 
but then there also is something in there as well. And I'm, I'll get to why I still am a follower uh, of Christianity, why I use that terminology. But I just want to say unpack it a little bit because I think the word term Christianity can be a negative toxic term in some ways. John Claude actually said that Christianity is an oriental religion and mystical religion. And then, um, which I would even go on to say that it's not so much a religion as it is a the a, a a way of life. It's a focused way of focusing on Jesus and Nazareth. Um, Bishop Calista Ware actually says this. He says Christianity is more than a theory about the universe, more than a teachings written down on paper. It's a path on which we journey. It's the deepest sense of life, a way of life. And and this may sound strange to some people because again, I know there's a lot of stuff dissertations being thrown out there. But I think when we could look back through the layers, we look through, you know, the forest and we get beyond the forest and we look really start looking and paying attention to the mountains and the rocks and the trees that are coming in there. We really kind of start seeing that there's something deeper that's beyond the dissertations that are actually been twisted or um, almost a bastardization of the faith in so many ways, but it's, it is following of Jesus and Nazareth as a way of life. John the Apostle once said, he goes, I'm not writing you a new commandment, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. The old commandment is a message you've heard. And I'm writing a new commandment. And this truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is shining. Creation is good. Life is good. I think there's this thing of where the creator has left a spark within each of us. We were created in his image or in her image, if you want to use that terminology, or they image, if you want to use a, a neutral uh, pronoun. I don't think the pronoun matters. Um, but when you look at the creator, I think the creator, when he, he she left this um, image into us as we walk through it. And as being a come back to those original teachings of life, of walking in that path, is getting beyond just the intellectual thinking of, oh, it's Sunday or this or that. It's a way of life. It's how do we do it? Um, there was, I think in one way, it was talking about our spirituality is, it's in the mundane things. It's how do we wash our hair? How do we drink our coffee? How do I talk to my kids? How do I treat my animals? How do I um, treat the my lawn? How do I, you know, all those things is that way of life that comes in there that I think is is very important to be able to have. And it's that which I think is is really powerful in that way. So and I think also um, King David, this is more of the Hebraic, that uh, that tradition that's kind of been part of what's now called Christianity it says that the heaven declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. You know, day after day, they pour forth speech and night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard for them. But their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And that's that thing of the creator has left her fingerprints throughout it. Now, when it comes to why the core of Christianity, the core of why even I as an indigenous person still kind of follow this is it does come down to Jesus and Nazareth. And what I mean by that is I really think that there's something really special about Jesus and Nazareth in that he was the creator. It was this mystic experience of this mystery thing of where the creator actually became created to be able to help us through. Uh, John says, the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing else had been made. In him's life, and that life is the light of mankind. The light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and melt among us. We have seen his glory, and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It is this sense that the creator became a credit. Uh, one of the great um, saints of yesterday, the early church, says, let him or her marvel at what so ordinary means divine to be manifest to us, that by death, mortality has been reached to us all, and that by the word become man, the universal providence that they may known. It is given a ticker of the very word of God, for he's made man that we might be made man. Or he was made man so we might be made God. He has manifest himself into a body that may receive the ideal of the unseen father. He has endured the insolence of man so we might inherit immortality. It is a sense that the that 
the creator again. It's just again, again, it may sound crazy, and I guess that's where the mystic because I think it is a really mystical thing. Because when you really pull back the layers, when you get into the forest and you start looking beyond just the vegetations that sometimes overgrow something, and you start peeling it back, you start realizing that um, at its core, the the faith of Christianity is is a lot more mysterious and is a lot more mystical than than what we have being talked about in the what I would say the abuses of happening right now in a lot of places there's something really crazy about the incarnation that comes in um master the confessor said the great mystery of the incarnation remains a mystery internal for not 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 only is what not yet been seen of it is greater than what has been revealed for revealed merely to the extent that those saved by it can grasp it but also even what is revealed remains entirely hidden and by no means as it really is there's something this powerful about that that comes in. It's um, I quote a lot because it's pretty powerful to me. This is where I live, my elders. But the Saint Gregory of Nicaea says, "Anyone who truly describes infallible light in the language is truly a liar, not because he hates the truth, but because the inadequacy of his descriptions." Or even in more modern times, um, Peter Rowland would say, "That which we cannot speak of is the one thing to whom and to." about whom and to whom we must never stop speaking. So to me, that is, it's like, it's, it's living in that Ozarks, it's living in those mountains where you're going through the woods and the trees and the vegetations and you're looking and sometimes you can be overwhelmed by this. But when you start looking deeper and you start looking and seeing, you see this mystical element, this element of the incarnation of like, what do we do with Jesus and Nazareth? Uh, was he a man? Was he a God? Or was he this? What is that? And unpacking what that is. And that to me speaks the incarnation of being able to say that there's something powerful about that, that helps me in my way of life, that I deal with um, everything I do, even how I talk, how I live my life. And yet I understand the mystery that whatever I may say is, it's, it's inevitably falls short. It can never, ever match what the reality is. That's why it's like, I will always be a liar because it can never really describe it not begin because i'm trying to lie but because i can never words cannot even um capture the creator of what that is but i must continue to talk about it and i think this is where it takes me into my next journey which is you know i said i've been living in along um the land of the shoshone and the bannock people uh, in what's called idaho and, and it's a desert land and the desert is a shy land it life stays hidden um, things don't change fast. The paths that you see in these pictures, um, they will be there for years. There's something that comes with it. Wagon tracks from the Oregon Trail, the mid 1800s are still invisible to today. It's, um, there's something that just, when you go out in the desert, it teaches you to be slower. It's a different, it's a different vibe of different land than the Ozarks that's full of just green revitalizations. You got to slow down and look. And to me, when I think about that, I look and I say, you know what, I can look at this and I say, I learned that I'm not the first person on this journey. Um, the ancestors have walked with the creator before. Um, there's people of traditional um, Jalagi or Cherokees I've talked to who receive visions and dreams in which um, Jesus of Nazareth has shown up to them. And they said, hey, look, you know, I, I am one of you. Uh, I am part of the real people that are here. And so those paths that are coming through there, it's like those experiences that come in that shapes me. Years ago, the um, um, the end prophet Jeremiah, there was there a big fight going on. Babel, uh, Jerusalem was being destroyed and the people of Israel were on the edge and say, what do we do? And he says, you know, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good ways are, and walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. To be able to follow that, again, this is not a new thing we're talking about, but an old thing. The stories, if you think about the stories, at least in the, the Hebraic Christian scriptures of um, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Deborah, they all had an experience with the creator that shaped their life. The elders in my tribe have had experiences with the, the, the supernatural that have shaped their life in going through it. These are what, to me, is like, that's the ancient paths to look back. Look back for those who have gone before us and say, hey, what's going on? How do we go? Um, I know a lot of times people talk about the, the scriptures and, and realizing that, you know, the scriptures, okay, it can, the, it can be helpful. 
in so many ways it can be um, misshoot. Uh, my brother, uh, who's talking about the Islamic, you'll hear this recently, he was talking about how the tradition of Islam had to interpret that. And I really think that that's powerful because the, in the Hebraic and the Christian faith, there are definitely schools of interpretation as well, that we see so much of it being tossed around as harmful instead of being able to be loved. And I think we have to peel back those layers and go back and really dig through the, uh, the vegetation, so to speak, to find the truth of what's happening. And I mentioned uh, before, and I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of the stream of structure. I'm trying to hopefully save time for um, some uh, Q&A when, when we're done, because uh, I know we're kind of going a little bit over. But when I think about being a mystic, I actually people can get concerned about that term. And so I love um, David Benner. He's a Euro-American. He says a mystic is simply someone who seeks above all else and know God is love. Mystics, therefore, are much more defined by the longing than their experience. They no longer to know God's love and thereby be filled with the very fullness of God. Christian mysticism is a participation in this transformational journey towards a union with God in love. Or if you have um, Charles Colony once wrote, he said, the mystery is not a specifical or not a category to which we throw everything that defines rational explanations is a way of being in relationship with God, humanity, and creation. We do not have to stress or strain ourselves to do this. We simply wake up to the presence and become conscious to the presence that's in us and around us. This is the way of mystery. This is what keeps us going. This is what brings life of digging through, looking at the desert, looking at the places going on. Among the Jalagi, we would have this phrase called tohi. And this ideal, there's no real good um, translation into English, but it's um, a way of peace, of balance, of harmony, of way of being in the world and, and around with all of our, our creation in harmony and balance with each other. Realizing that too much sorrow could be a bad thing, but too much victory could be a bad thing. Um, too much you know, happiness or too much depression is like, you know, it is to be in, in harmony or balance with this. It's tohi. It's, there's a sense that comes in there that actually really helps us sit in that balance. And I think that is something that's so missing because the typical dominant culture around us, which comes out of the philosophy of the Greek and Romans, and it's very much dichotomy. It's good, bad, it's light, dark, it's perfect, imperfect. It's this or it's that instead of both and to to really follow what I see, the creator or, or Jesus of Nazareth is to be in tohi with your relatives, your non-human, your human, to be able to walk with those before you as well as those who walk after you. Um, that we live not for ourselves, but also for those, again, seven generations that come um, after us that comes in. That we have to pay attention to what we're doing today impacts them. It's the way I drink my coffee. It's the way I um, clean the house is the way I, I work. All of that is the way of life on which we live on the path. Which, if I come back to to Jesus Nazareth, he once said, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind." This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is love your neighbor as yourself. The way of life of doing that, to me, is it. That is the jewel that I think we can unbury within the faith that carries within it, um, to he within that. So Wado, thank you. Um, I know I kind of went a little fast because I was trying to keep within our time frame. If there's any questions, I would love to hear them. Thank you so much, Joshua. Now I do see that there are some questions that have come up, but it, it seems as though you answered all three of them um, in one, one beautiful part of your talk. So before, um, if you want, if you want to take a look at them, you can take a look at them and see if there's anything you want to add to that. Um, I'm trying question. to actually get back to the questions. I can't even figure out how to okay. turn off um, my um, um, Zoom. <laughs> the questions um, say, when I'm in nature, I feel connected to the natural world and feel closer to God. Do you have any suggestions for? feeling close to nature and closer to God when we're in a city. 
I struggle with living in a city. I really do struggle. Um, I live in a, in a suburb right now, kind of a smaller community, uh, about 25,000 people next to a town of about 200. Even that makes me nervous. I have to leave and get out as much as I can to try to get out. Uh, but for those who are unable to, um, you know, for me, I think a lot of times I would suggestions is grow. Start a garden, start a, have a plant, have something in your house that you can to be able to do it. Um, find a park if you can find a park. Um, you know, be able to set some side of things to be able to go, okay, this is where I can actually go and actually have that calmness around that I have. Uh, those I would actually suggest to be able to do it. Or if you, if you're unable to have that, like you said, maybe you are unable to have a garden, try to try to make periodic trips um, out of the city um, to where you go or, or find a find a park. I It's hard. Um, and I know that not everybody has that, but hopefully that will help a little bit. If if you really have none of that. I a Blessings to you. I don't know how you would walk. That would be extremely hard. OK. Um there's a question here. How do we connect with and communicate with the spirits of the rocks and plants and animals? Well, I think um, that's a good question. Um, for me, it's stillness. It's being still. It's going out there. It is sitting. It's there. When I go out into um, the mountains, so like this is a picture I was hiking with my um, my son last year. And I go out there with the rocks, so it was sit on the rock. And I, when I come on there, I like, you know, ask permission to sit. And then you sit and you just listen and you just kind of be still. I think so much in our digital age, we're constantly bombarded by entertainment and things. And if we actually pause and stop and be still, then I think we'll hear from our non human relatives. We'll hear from the trees, the rocks, the animals, because we can actually start seeing this coming into it. And so, um, I think that's one way to really connect to it is to be still in the stop and just listen um, and allow yourself to um, to see what they have to say. Excellent. Thank you. And then the last question here. Um, how do you follow the mystic path without getting lost in the weeds? No, this assumes the weeds are bad. Um, not all weeds are bad. Weeds are uh, some what some things are what we call weeds are actually flowers. Uh, dandelions are actually a beautiful flower that feeds our bees and and supports our ecosystem. But a lot of people will call them a weed in their gardens. Uh, so I would uh, be careful about what getting lost is because or what weeds are because sometimes you may find treasures in that journey. But I would say to me, you know, my journey is to follow your uh, the ones before you. Um, there is, you know, like this talk, and there's a lot of people who followed the path before us. Um, for me, within the Christian mystic path, you know, there's different mystical paths. I will, you know, we've heard different people talk. Uh, for me, it's going back to the early church fathers. It's going to some of those people who have been recognized by the community as saying, these are people who have um, something seen and valuable coming on them. Uh, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avalon, um, there's so many people that have actually kind of bubbled through the years. It's going back to, um, like for, for me, Cross and Smith, one of the uh, Jolly Gee elders. So it's actually surrounding those, those who've gone before you who have actually passed away. It's actually being lived in a community. The mystic past is one, I think, where you have to have other people around you. Um, we're not to be in isolation. We're not an isolated individualistic kind of, you know, go off into the sky kind of stuff is with to be lived in community. So that way, when you're seeing something, and you're going like, well, am I off kilter? Is this not fitting with um, the love and compassion in balance and harmony? Then you could talk to those people around you and say, hey, what do you think about this one? What about this? What about that? And then they can help guide you and pull you around. So it's your community that you have right now. It's the community of your ancestors who've come before you. And then, of course, it's just the spirit. Uh, the spirit, she is an amazing thing. Um, I think, you know, within the, the Christian tradition, when Jesus Nazareth was going to the cross, his last night, he, when he was looking at his followers and they were, he said, you'll be scattered and I will die. He goes, that will send you the Holy Spirit and that she will guide you into all truth. He didn't say, I'll give you a book. 
I did. I, you know, here's a book. Follow the book, or go follow the Torah. Or go follow it. He said, "I will send you the Spirit of the Creator, and she will guide you into that." And so I think that is part of also to help us uh, uh, guide us as well. That's a a great segue into my next question. I love your answer, by the way. Um, my personal question is, you know, being a Christian mystic, obviously, you value the scriptures, you have the Old Testament, and the New Testament, but how, and, and and you probably look at some of the, the other literature throughout Christianity, but how, um, how do you incorporate some of those other Eastern teachings? Are you, do you study, um, do you study Eastern religion? Do you look at, at, for example, the Mahabharata, or you look at the Bhagavad Gita, or you, you, uh, you look into Buddhism, and you read the Dhammapada, and you incorporate that all together? Or do you just, and what do you, what do you think are, what are your scriptures, you personally, and, and how do you view, and so sorry, we don't have very much time, but how do you view other, um, other cultures, uh, words from creator? No, it's very good. I, I definitely think, um, first of all, I think the creator has left um, his image in in all people all the time. I don't think he's ever or she, again, whatever pronoun you use, has ever abandoned anybody. Um, so I definitely think there's echoes of of the creator throughout all cultures and all all, um, all thought spiritualities, which I think is really cool. For myself, I have not really looked at, really dove into, like I said, um, some of the, the Buddhism is or... Um, other different Hinduism, other different things. I've, I've dove a little bit, but not real deep. Not because of, mostly because of time, to be quite honest. Um, I have really leaned into uh, the Jalagi tradition. My tradition is an indigenous person here and really trying to really follow those as well as looking into some of the, um, again, what we would call the, the Bible. Granted, there's there's actually some um, Eastern Orthodox faith that includes some other chapters besides the Protestant Bible. So I think there's some other um, areas in there. So I've really kind of leaned into that, into some of the Celtic Christianity of my ancestors, but then also to the Jalagi. Um, but it's mostly because of time. <laughs> you, you only have so much t- hours to be able to spend. I would uh, love to be a full-time um uh, person being able to ponder and, and pray through this stuff, but uh, as a as an individual who has a full time job and working, it this is not always possible. If I could become a monk, though, that would be awesome. <laughs> right, and a family. You have children, yeah. too, right? So there's only exactly. time in a day. Yes, uh, but yes, I, I've actually thought about uh, being a monk would be fun because then you would have more time to really uh, ponder the path of of the journey. But that is not that journey is not my journey. So. I understand. Thank you so much, Joshua. I really appreciate you coming to speak and share with us today. Thank you. What Okay. Um, our next speaker got up very early tomorrow morning to join us here today. Gail Q joins us all the way from Australia. I'm super excited to hear her speak. I do know a little bit about her spiritual path, but I'm very interested to hear more. She's a retired business owner, former rodeo, radio presenter and current administrator in a small business. She also um, is an editor and a proofreader, a blogger, and an esoteric yoga practitioner. In the year 2000, she came across Ageless Wisdom, so named because its guiding principles remain the same throughout the ages, yet are always applicable to the current era. Ageless Wisdom is not a philosophy, but rather a lived way. We've talked a lot about that today. The community, known as the Students in the Way of Livingness, consider it their religion, meaning their return to God. Welcome, Gail. You know, it's very early for you down there. Thank you so much for being a part of our celebration. An absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've lived in Australia for 35 years, but you may notice from my accent that I was born and raised in North America. I've been asked today to speak about my relationship with the Divine Creator, and it's an honor to be here today as a lay person. I think it's important to mention this because we all have equal access to God. It doesn't matter which country we were born in, which country we live in, what our uh, 
political beliefs might be, even what our religious beliefs might be, we all have equal access to God. So I'll tell you just a little bit about myself to give you the context of how I became a student of the Ageless Wisdom. When I was growing up, my brothers and I went to Sunday school with my mother who went to a church service. My father didn't go to church. By the time I was about 12 or 13, I just dug my heels in and said, I'm not going to go anymore. None of this makes sense to me. And I didn't have anyone in my life who could present it to me in a way that was meaningful. So that was it for me. Uh, I went on to go to school, graduated, got married, had children, became a working parent. And life was good. It had its ups and downs, but I didn't really feel like anything was missing. And then in 1985, uh, my, we were still living in Montana at that time. My husband and I took a business trip to New Zealand and we stopped and spent some time in Tahiti. Now, that trip was just that moment in time. It, it was a magical trip, although it was very ordinary. It was a business trip. But it was my time to uh, wake up. My, my soul came and spoke to me. By the time I got home a few weeks later, I was quite a different person. I was in a relationship with the divine creator from the moment I woke up in the morning. It, it just was my time. So to fast forward the story a little bit, and my husband and I decided that we were young enough and brave enough at that point to change our life completely. So we sold the business, the house, the cars, we packed up the kids, and we took off. Now, people think, wow, how do you do that with, you know, a bunch of teenagers? <laughs> but it didn't seem that uh, like that much effort at the time because we were responding to a, an inner movement that was happening for us. We were being guided that this is what we needed to do with our life. We did end up on the east coast of Australia in a small surfing community called Byron Bay, which is a physically incredibly beautiful place and uh, known for the surf, but also it's probably considered the new age capital of Australia. So you might liken it to something like Sedona, Arizona or Boulder, Colorado. And my husband and I started a music store, a music festival, and we gathered together a group of people who wanted to start community radio. My husband's passion was sharing the music. Mine turned out to be interviewing people. And so I interviewed local business people, local ministers, and being the new age capital of Australia, every spiritual guru who came to Australia came to Byron Bay and I interviewed them. I had a lot of questions and they had some answers and others didn't. And then in um, around the year 2000, I met someone who was and is the living, breathing transmission of the ageless wisdom. And I went on to interview him eight times in the next few years. I did continue to interview others for a couple of years, but then I became uncomfortable putting out um, philosophies that I didn't feel were really offering people a way forward. And so I quit interviewing people and I had found my path. I became a student of the ageless wisdom. So I also have some PowerPoints today, which I'm going to share with you now. Being the fourth speaker, we might all have a little bit of ear fatigue right now. So the PowerPoints will help us stay focused on a few more words. The Aegis Wisdom is a personal examination of the nature of the soul and the development of consciousness. So this is a very succinct summary of what it is. Uh, obviously, it's a very in-depth personal examination. It becomes a way of life, much like Joshua made reference to it. It is the way of life. The core principle, we'll say, behind the ageless wisdom is that everything is energy. So I want to give you a little background on the Ageless Wisdom. 
uh, so that we can understand how we live it. If everything is energy, everything happens because of energy. Now, this is a well-known science. We all know Einstein's E equal MC squared. But we're not living it every day. We're not living as if everything is energy. So we appear as form, but our original and current state of being is still energy. Energy is a vibration and it vibrates at different speeds. And this is what forms different densities. In the Age of Wisdom, we say that God is an all-encompassing spherical energy. So picture that, that sphere, that pulsating sphere. It's a vibration. And that vibration is an ever-expanding and evolving energy, creating galaxies and universes right down to every grain of sand. We, in the Age of Wisdom, we call ourselves students of the Age of Wisdom because we're constantly learning every day. We're learning about what life is, who we are, what's going on around us. But that original vibration we call the one song, where everybody and everything is all vibrating together. We all have the divine spark within us. So we have that original vibration within us. So how did we end up here in the if you look around us, it feels pretty chaotic out there right now. So we're going to use the term the fall from grace because this is a term that people are familiar with. But what does it mean? Well, this is our understanding that in the beginning, we're all vibrating as the one vibration. We're all singing the one song, so to speak, being made in God's image because God is expanding. Everything is in Again, I agree with Joshua, pronouns aren't important here. God is neither male nor female, and God is both male and female. So we'll say he, being non-gender specific. There's the one vibration made in his image. We also, as individual vibrations, had the will to create. And so a fragmentation happened in that original energy and certain aspects, certain fragments became enamored with the idea that they could create on their own. And that's where it went wrong. That's the fall from grace. They didn't co-create with God. They started um, creating on their own. So, again, just for the uh, explanation graphics of it, these figures aren't the right figures, but they will help us understand. Let's say the fragmentation occurred, made a decision to step away from God. And from that position, they made another decision further away from God, another decision further away from God. Let's say we've made 99 decisions away from God. So here we are today. We still have the original 1% vibration in tune with the one song. But we've got 99% of us that has stepped away from God. This brings me to uh, the next concept that I'd like to offer you in understanding the ageless wisdom. And that's the term soul and spirit. I know a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, that they mean the same thing. But in the ageless wisdom, they're distinctly different. And it's important to understand that before we can continue with the, the conversation about the ageless wisdom. The soul is our original essence. It's God within. And that soul cannot be destroyed or wounded or stolen. It always remains connected to God. We always have that aspect of ourselves that's singing the one song that's moving with the divine creator. We're all unique, like every snowflake, but we are all equal in that we all have access to God. We all have the divine spark within us. Now, the spirit is that aspect of ourselves that broke away 
it's the fragmentation, if you will, the ego, the personality, that inconsistent part in us that varies in being love. So the spirit is very much driven by our individuality, by the delineation of me, me, me. And that results in the us and them mentality that we see around the world today. So the spirit does not like the idea of us becoming one. It likes being an individual. It likes being in control. Sort of likes being the bully on the playground. So the spirit is that voice of self-doubt. It's the voice of self-loathing. It's that voice that's keeping you small. The spirit doesn't want you to realize your grandness doesn't want you to realize the connection to God. So this is where we are today. We've got 99% of us is spirit because we've taken that many decisions and steps away from God. The 1% is still there, but you can imagine we have to listen pretty closely nowadays to hear that 1% of us, to hear that divine spark because the spirit has a very loud voice. Oh, let me just see where I'm, something's gotten off track that I'm not, here we go. Okay, so we say becoming the master of our wayward spirit, knowing which energy we are aligned to. Are we aligned to the voice of the soul or are we being driven by spirit? This is the only mastership worth having is knowing which energy we're aligned to. It's a full-time job. Don't, don't think it's an easy, oh, we've got one job, checking our alignment. Well, it means checking it every moment. So this brings us to today. This brings us to the moment. How do we make this applicable? We've got this philosophy, if you want to call it that, of ener everything is energy, that we've had the fall from grace, we've stepped away from God. Well, how do we apply that? in our day-to-day -day living. This is our religion in the 21st century. We call it the way of the livingness. So it's not about what you're doing, but rather the quality you're in while you're doing it. So you can be driving a car. It doesn't matter what kind of a car. It can be a, a Porsche or a, it can be an old beat up pickup truck. It doesn't matter if you're driving on the left side of the road or the right side or where you're going or what country you're in. What matters is how are you driving that car? So as students of the Age of Wisdom, we look deeper into these things. It's like, how did you open the car door? What energy were you in? How did you fasten your seatbelt? How are your hands on the steering wheel? How present are you when you're driving? And it also applies to everything you're doing. Um, when you're out buying groceries, many of us now are familiar with the concept that the energy you cook your food in does affect the nutritional value of it, affects your digestion. But again, we look deeper into life. We, it starts before you're cooking your food. It's the energy you bought your food in. It doesn't matter which store you've shopped at or if you've bought organic, if you can afford organic or not. It's about the energy, your presence when you're buying that food. It's in everything you do, mowing the lawn, brushing your teeth. Again, I'm saying a lot of the things that Joshua did and the other speakers before me today. This is the common, this is the unity in humanity. Unconditional love, this is a term that's in many religions. Um, something that's maybe just a little twist on it for us is that we acknowledge that it's only through learning to love ourselves unconditionally that we can learn to love others unconditionally. Uh, it may require forgiving ourselves. If we want to forgive others, if, if we feel there's a need for forgiveness, we have to be able to forgive ourselves first, our mistakes. We're all have made mistakes. We're human. There's no way we haven't made mistakes. But we can still love ourselves unconditionally, just as God loves us unconditionally. 
and and God doesn't love one person more than another. It just isn't possible because God is love. It's not about this person or that person. So we are all equal, including ourselves. Many of us were raised to put others first. We go last. But the little bit of a twist here is that we are all equal. We all are loved equally. One, one way that supports us to do this is to be an observer of life. Observe what's happening around us. And we focus on that 1% of ourselves that is still connected to God. And we see ourselves as a God interacting with other gods. We don't see ourselves as sinners or that there's any need for judgment. We see ourselves as the God interacting with other gods. We often talk about walking the path of return. And so what does that mean for us? It's, it's evolved. We're always evolving, but we're not becoming something that we're unfamiliar with. We're not trying to achieve something that we've never been before. We're actually returning to our original state. This is walking the return path. Now, we've been eons out here while walking, wandering in the wilderness. We've accumulated a lot of mud and twigs and branches and leaves. We put on a few extra coats and um, galoshes and all kinds of things to weather this trip in the wilderness. So walking the path of return is actually about taking off, brushing off some of those twigs, knocking off the mud, taking off a few layers of um, clothing. This is all metaphoric, of course. And so what we're talking about in that way is to put down the the aspects of individuality that we have picked up. And that means um, becoming humble, stop being arrogant, stop judging others, stop judging ourselves, um, recognizing if there's jealousy or comparison or competition. And all of these things fall under the banner of being an individual. So if we have the task of stopping being an individual or diminish, diminishing our individuality, that's a pretty big task. How do we go about it? Because we do appear to be in form as individual individuals. So how do we break this down? Well, in the Ageless Wisdom, we do it through the concept of brotherhood. And the age's wisdom is always ever practical. So how do we create brotherhood in our day to day? One way we do it is we have a lot of shared meals uh, every week. Last night, I had a group of people over to my house. Once a week, I go somewhere for dinner. Somebody's invited me for dinner. Everyone brings a plate and we it's kind of a two hour thing. And we share a meal. We all clean up. It's a way of being together in brotherhood. The other thing we do a lot of in my community is shared living. So there may be young families who will have an older person living with them, renting a bedroom. They become part of the family. They're not built-in babysitters. They contribute to family decisions. And I myself, uh, for the last six years, I've been in shared living with other working adults. And we also do a lot of group work and different kinds of group work. We might, I mean, we've had flooding in my area, so we might, members of our community might go assist with the flood cleanup. But we also do group work in terms of um, being the tech age, we do a lot online. We have a lot of group meetings from around the world. My community is international. I, I live in a place in Australia where there are several hundred students of the Ages Wisdom. So I have the privilege of face-to-face -face shared meals, but we do have students all around the world. So um, some of them are living in uh, physical isolation 
might be one in Japan and one in Colombia. We even have a student in Mongolia. <laughs> and so they organize Zoom meetings to have shared meals. But we do a lot online and we've built a lot of websites over the last 20 years. I'll give you an address to get further information. And so this is a way of, again, letting go of individuality. We might write an article, but we submit it to others to edit and to proofread. It comes back to us. They want to change the title. Uh, they want to take this paragraph out. I'll tell you, in the beginning, it was messy. People's feelings were hurt and people were very much about ownership. I wrote this article and I want my name on it. And you'll see on our websites, a lot of articles don't have names because we've let go of ownership of the articles. They've become group articles. So these are practices, daily practices we have in letting go of individuality, starting to listen to the soul, not being driven by the spirit. We're practicing singing the one song. Again, metaphorically, we're not singing Amazing Grace or something like that. <laughs> Now, a very, very important concept to us is that we care for our body, and that's because it's the temple of our soul. And we do everything to support ourselves to be able to hear the voice of the soul. So we go early to bed, early to rise. So me getting up this morning in Australia on your tomorrow wasn't that big of a challenge for me. I work a lot with Europeans and um people in Wales and England, Scotland. So I'm, I'm used to getting up very early, depending on the time of year. In that, we develop a familiarity with stillness. We find the joy in steadiness. It's in that stillness, again, repeating what Joshua said, that we can hear the voice of the soul. We can hear the voice of God. So to support ourselves in being still, we avoid stimulants. We avoid drugs, alcohol, TV is a major stimulant, including the news. That's, you know, it's just so filled with fear mongering. It's very hard to stay still if you're watching the news. We avoid racy foods like sugar and caffeine. And we avoid dulling foods like gluten and dairy that make you quite lethargic. This is all to support honoring the temple of our soul. We go for walks in presence. Troubles become much smaller when you're outside. Uh, we let go of emotions and reactions. We just don't take them on. We're the observers and we don't bury reactions in our body. And for many of us, because we didn't have this in our younger years, we had a lot of stuff stored in our body that we had to clear through esoteric healing modalities so that we can experience the stillness. So this is our religion. It's a very day-to-day -day practical way of being. And what is religion? Well, the Latin origins of the word religion is religare, meaning to rebind. And that's what the Ageless Wisdom is about, is rebinding our soul to the one song, rebinding to God. That's what our religion is. And what is love? Always that big eternal question. Love is an observation. So we don't have to be concerned so much about what other people are doing. That's already built into the divine plan. That's being taken care of. Don't have time to go into reincarnation here. It's a given in ageless wisdom because God in its ever loving divine plan has given us karma, acacia, and reincarnation. We get chance, opportunity after opportunity to get it right. If we don't get it right, we just come back and we do it again until we do get it right. If love is an observation, which is God always observing us, not judging us because it's built into the plan, there, there will be um, that day where we have to account for our actions in this life and in our previous lives, how we live today will affect our next life. But we can observe. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are here in the world. That's the truth. But we don't have to be caught up in the mass consciousness or that incredible drive of the individual spirit. 
In stillness, we hear the voice of the soul. So that's a very, very brief summary of the ageless wisdom. I've tried to give you just a few key concepts. And if you would like to know more, this is one of our biggest websites. I work on this website with hundreds of people from around the world. It's called unimedliving.com. You will find lots of articles there on women's health, men's health, meditation, exercise, uh, great recipes, gluten-free, dairy-free recipes. And also, if you would like to know about the lineage of the Asia's Wisdom, because there have been hundreds of teachers of the Asia's Wisdom throughout the years, um, people you may not realize were teachers of the Asia's Wisdom, uh, like Shakespeare and Leonardo da Vinci, um, Francis Bacon, there, there's many, many teachers, and the lineage is spelled out on this website. That's it from me for the Ages Wisdom. If there's any questions, happy to see if I can answer them. Thank you so much, Gail. I appreciate that. We do have a couple of questions that have come in here. The first one says, <clears throat> is it possible to enhance the livingness of others? Yes, but we do this uh, again from being, um, we're not trying to control or manipulate or put demands, have expectations or conditions on somebody else. But through our own livingness, by reflecting to others the joy in the steadiness, uh, demonstrating through your movements how you buy your groceries, how you open um, the car door, how you interact with the person at the service department, all of this has an impact. And, and I can tell you, I've seen it so many times, as have my um, fellow students of the Ageless Wisdom. It's one of the joys we have is in sharing stories of uh, the, the mystery, the unexpected comments that come from people. Uh, when we're just going about our daily life. So I guess to me, it reminds me of the quote that um, that you you be the change that you wish to see. And so that that kind of plays a role in that, right? When you when you walk in the path of of livingness, you exemplify that and then other people can um, recognize that and, and kind of join along at that same frequency, right? Uh, absolutely yeah okay so the second question is um do out-of-body experiences have a place in the practice of ageless wisdom hmm. uh i'm going to say no and just offer a little explanation in that is that in in this moment well, yeah there's sort of two ways to answer that in this moment, we are incarnate in a body. So to leave this body is irresponsible because in, in this moment, we are responsible for this vehicle. And to, to leave it is not good practice. Um, you wouldn't leave your car running or moving down the road. You wouldn't decide to step out of it. These are living, moving vehicles. So we have a responsibility to stay here. And at the same time, we are multidimensional beings. So it's an often um, people think this is it. This, this is all there is to life or that we are only human. In the Asia's wisdom, we recognize that we are much bigger than this human experience. Uh, many of us would have had the experience of a sixth sense where we just know you walk into a room you can feel something's going on in it. We And the stiller we become, the more access we have to what's going on around us in dimensions that are not vibrating in the dense form of the physicality. In that way, you could say we are having an out-of-body experience all the time because our awareness expands and expands and we become aware of vibrations and dimensions that are bigger than the physical body but we would never abandon or leave 
and have an out of body experience. Okay, thank you. I know we've fallen a little bit behind, but I do have one more question. You said um, in terms of reincarnation, you 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 continue to reincarnate until you get it right. And so I, I was wondering in ageless wisdom, what get it right looks like. <laughs> Great pull up because that's not good terminology. <laughs> there is no right or wrong other than um, to be loving, to, to be love. And so we're not making decisions based on, um, I want this job promotion. So if I make this person over here look bad, that makes me look good. And then I'll get that job and then I'll be able to better take care of my family. You know, there, there can be this individual way of thinking, whereas in the Asia's wisdom, any decision has to consider the all. So a true advance or promotion at work can only take place soulfully if you have given yourself and the other people an equal chance for that promotion. So that's, I guess, when I say get it right, it means um, make decisions that are based on loving care of everyone equally and diminishing the individual needs and goals, but, but working in brotherhood. If, if there is such a thing as getting it right, it's about recognizing that we all have to travel this journey together. I'm not going to return to God on my own. We're only going to all return to God together. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Gail. I really appreciate you coming in and joining in this, this talk with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you to the other speakers. I've really enjoyed being here with everyone. All right. So our last speaker, I'd like to welcome Denver. Denver C. Snuffer Jr. He lives in Sandy, Utah. He was admitted to practice law in 1980 in Utah and remains a practicing attorney. Uh, he was a convert to the LDS faith in 1973 when he was 19 years old. And he was excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints exactly 40 years later for writing a book called Passing the Heavenly Gift. During those 40 years, he served on the stake high council, taught doc gospel doctrine and priesthood classes for 21 years. He's the author of many books, including The Second Comforter, Conversing with the Lord Through the Veil. Welcome, Denver. How are you doing, Jill? Um, I've been listening to everyone's talk before now, and while I would use a different vocabulary, much of what got said would be something that could be said in um, my faith, uh, just using a different vocabulary. There are only a handful of predominant religions in the world, but to a believer, I don't think the numbers matter. Um, the truth, if someone's got what they believed to be truth, is something that people like to hold on, even if there are few who find it, to quote uh, Christ, the numbers in various predominant religions run something like this. There's a total of 2.38 billion Catholics in the world, or excuse me, Christians in the world, of which 1.3 billion are uh, Catholic and 1 billion are Protestant. There are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. But surprisingly, 1.5 billion out of that are Sunni, and only 270 million are estimated to be Shia. 1.2 billion Hindu, 506 million Buddhists, 26.4 million Sikhs. Mormons slightly outnumber the number of Jews in the world at 16.6 .6 million Mormons, nominally Mormon and 15.8 million Jews, and Taoists, there are 8.7 million. I belong to a small group of people that believe in Mormonism, and Mormonism is expansive in the sense that anyone that believes in the Book of Mormon is regarded as Mormon, but I don't belong to the largest sect of that, which is the um, Church of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 
I did once. Jill mentioned it was excommunicated. I'm part of a small group, maybe a few thousand people, trying to recapture the original dramatic living religion that Joseph Smith taught at the time that Joseph Smith was alive and restoring what's uh, regarded as the original religion that goes back to the time of Adam. Part of uh, that religion is belief in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon has a verse in it that says this, for behold, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom, all that he seeth fit that they should have. Therefore, we see that the Lord doth counsel in his wisdom according to that which is just and true. From that verse, I take it that no matter where you go, what nation you're involved with, what tongue is spoken, what vocabulary gets applied, that all the religions that there are in the world have some relation to God and that God intended for these diverse belief systems to be out there, and that if you, as part of your belief system, have something that is true, and you have an opportunity to offer that to me, that I ought to be willing to accept it, that truth belongs in one aggregated whole and not splintered as it is, but it's up to us to undertake the effort to do that gathering. There's pressure on every religion to change, and that pressure begins immediately. Before Muhammad was dead, the religion was under pressure to change. After he was dead, there was pressure to change it before it was reduced to writing. By the time it was reduced to writing, there were multiple forms of the Quran. The um, uh, wars were fought and books were burned in order to bring Islam into a unified single text. That mirrors what happened in Christianity with the fights that occurred in the second and third century of Christianity in trying to settle on what was the correct bundle of beliefs and warring factions uh, fighting one another until finally there became one universal or Catholic Christian faith and um, it predominated. Forces and arguments that apply to uh, religions today suggest that religious beliefs are outdated. There are arguments that they're harmful to the individual or they're harmful to society, or they're an impediment to the progress of science or human humanity. And in recent decades, there's been a precipitous decline in the West of biblical moral values, and that's been mirrored by similar declines in the East. This decline has paralleled the rapid escalation of culture shifts, such as relativism and materialism, individualism and secularism. These have caused all religions in general to become increasingly marginalized throughout the world. Since the Industrial Revolu Revolution, social change has been initiated increasingly by the youth. Economic uh, changed the opportunities that children were afforded because of the Industrial Revolution. And that separated children from their parents' professions. Before then, a butcher's children grew up to be a butcher. A carpenter's children grew up to be carpenters, brick masons, produced brick masons, and so on. But the revolution allowed new opportunities for the children and they separated not only from their parents physically, but also increasingly culturally and religiously. But <clears throat> it's a biblical curse to be led by children. And since World War II, children have been at the leading edge of social change and religious change. An observer of the upheaval wrote a song about what was un underway in 1963. He wrote it because of what he perceived to be the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times that was then underway. 
It was written in September and October of 1963. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving and you better start swimming and you better or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing. And more directly, a verse later, come mothers and fathers throughout all the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command for your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a changing. As the present now will later be passed, the order is rapidly fading. And the first one now will later be last for the times they are a changing. That was true in the post-World War II uh, baby boom generation, but modern, modern uh, social media and modern um, communications and social networks have increasingly skewed the development of social change into the hands of the youth. And not to be left on the side, there are a lot of um, deliberate forces who have studied social change, who interject themselves directly into the process of leading that social change from behind nameless, faceless walls where they interject into the stream um, ideas that are increasingly amoral, increasingly um, selfish, self-centered, uh, sexually deviant, destructive of the family, destructive of religious traditions and religious histories that, that we want to hold on to. As uh, Kevin uh, talked about his return to an earlier form of religion because of his discouragement from uh, what he saw in Christianity, so likewise, the social media change is encouraging everyone to abandon the mores and the um, anchor that the um, religious values they were raised with provided to them. Um, John Lennon wrote a song uh, that was based upon a book that uh, was written by. Um, Timothy Leary, uh, who uh, paraphrased from the Tibet Book of the Dead. And so ideas from Buddhism crept into the social change underway in the 1960s uh, in the form of the, the Buddhist ideas that infected the lyrics of John Lennon. Later, um, all of the Beatles attended a lecture in August of 1967 by the Maharishi Mahash Yogi at the Hilton Hotel in London. Afterwards, they met with him privately. They were favorably impressed and they went up to Bangor in North Wales for a weekend seminar. While the Beatles were in uh, Wales at the seminar of the Maharaja, uh, Brian Epstein, the one who had managed the Beatles died. And uh, the death of the Beatles manager coinciding with the transcendental meditation instruction, no doubt had a great deal to do with the Beatles' decision to move to India in February of 1987 for several months of training. While there, um, it was one of the most productive songwriting periods of the band but it ended badly when the Maharishi was accused of inappropriate sexual misconduct. Cultural currents of Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and in John Lennon's case, atheism, all merged into the music of the Beatles and an onslaught of cultural drift um, from social media giants today is also spreading a new wave of innovation, confusion, irreligion, mixed religion, and we find ourselves in the midst of materialism, hedonism, sexual confusion, and intolerance predominating in the new values that are attempting to replace the old ones that are based on the traditional 
traditional religions. Well, this conference is supposed to be comparing notes, so to speak, across religious faiths. All lives are temporary. We learn from the past what the dead leave us in writing, song, architecture, and social structure. But we will soon be joining our dead ancestors, and the question arises, well, what are we going to leave to benefit our posterity, who will arrive after us when we've departed from this temporary place? Why would we choose to leave something? What could possibly be the most important thing we can bequeath? I'd suggest that words of truth resonate across every culture, across every religion, across every language. They're not only the most valuable thing that we can leave behind, but they are also the most enduring. Truth outlasts brick and mortar. It endures beyond empires, it moves nations, it gives meaning to life, and it raises our eyesight above the ground and lets us peer into eternity. Uh, Kevin mentioned the star theology of the Blackfeet. Uh, star theology is very much a part of a true religion. Uh, ultimately, we hope to build a temple, and in the temple, I expect there will be a great deal that memorializes in architecture a true uh, star theology. I want to thank everyone who's participated from uh, their vantage point and giving us what they have given us. I believe that God is knowable. I believe that it's part of the quest of uh, meaning in this life for us to seek to know God and to obtain uh, understanding directly from him and not derivatively simply from books or from the past, but to let a religion live in us in which God's presence through us is manifest in the earth by the things we say, the things we do, the things we think. Now, uh, I was told to leave time for questions, and so I want to, uh, to do that. But I also want to point out that <clears throat> there's, a, there's a point in the Old Testament where the uh, patriarchal father of the 12 tribes of Israel is in the process of giving blessings to prophesy what is going to befall his posterity on to the end of the end of time. And his uh, oldest son, Reuben, was given a blessing, which says, Reuben, you, my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity, and the excellence of power, unstable as water, you shall not prosper. Now, the way I have read that most often in the past is that he's telling him, that Reuben in his posterity is going to be too unstable in their convictions and their way of life to prosper. But recently I've had a change of mind, and I think what he's saying is, if you are unstable as water, you will not prosper. And I think that admonition, that warning, that counsel to the son Reuben is applicable to all of us, and that when we allow our religious convictions to become unstable, unanchored in the solidity of, of what is enduring and eternal, then we become incapable of prospering. And so I would end by saying, be true and believing to your faiths, to the traditions you've held that are true, be solid as a rock, in resisting the winds of compromise and doubt, because they surely are upon us. Oh, there's one question I see here. I've called up the questions asking about what song it was. It's Tomorrow Never Knows, a song that got its title not from the book, but from a, one of Ringo Starr's malapropisms, A Hard Day's Night, Eight Days a Week. These are just things that Ringo Starr would say, and uh, the title of John Lennon's song was Tomorrow Never Knows, because Ringo would utter that, and it's, um, it's one of the most innovative songs that the Beatles introduced, uh, the last song on the Revolver album, and it would point the way to where that band was headed. Um, okay, so here's a question that says, if Joseph Smith was 
oriented to the religion of Adam, will it not require us to grow in understanding what Adam understood? Yes, absolutely. Without any doubt, it will take a great deal to, um, to make the leap across from where we are now into a religion that is far more comprehensive um, and far, far more oriented towards nature and eternity. The stars, when you, when you look at the stars, uh, for example, you're literally looking back billions of years just to the naked eye. Um, and so being quiet and going out at night and looking up at the star fields um, is one way to project yourself back into eternity billions and billions of years visually because they are what you're seeing now is something from the long distant past and it's right there available uh for you to behold and for you to meditate upon and it's a um it's a way to connect you up by being still with uh, a much greater uh consciousness that fills the immensity of space and originates from god himself so another question how do you suggest someone moves from connecting with god through scripture to connecting with God directly through experience or spirit. Um, every bit of scripture that you read, every profound idea that you encounter has an effect on you. And if you slow down, and you allow it to sink deeply into your heart and your mind. And if you consider it carefully, the, um, the idea will eventually occur to you that you're not separated in time and space from that which is timeless and eternal, but that you too are part of that. There's a sermon given by King Benjamin in uh, the Book of Mosiah, of uh, the Book of Mormon, in which he, he points out that God is sustaining you by his power from moment to moment by lending you breath so that you might live and move and do according to your own will. What that statement by King Benjamin tells you is that the very breath that you breathe connects you to God because he's lending it to you. Without that connection directly and immediately with God, you wouldn't be able to breathe. Therefore, there's an immediacy and a familiarity between you and God that exists innately. How you connect is to begin to pay attention to that. And then there's this question, what is one of the mo more, most important truths you ponder throughout the day? Where do you spend your time thinking and pondering? Well, um, there's a lot of things that have to be done. There's a lot of things that are currently underway or that will shortly be underway that require um, careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts. Um, I contemplate about the potential for failure. I contemplate the potential for my own weakness and my own inability. I contemplate about how um, odd the responses are by those who are both opposed to and those that are over eager with um, what God is up to and doing today and about how hard it is to cut the middle cut the middle line and to keep everything in, in balance so that uh, it proceeds in an orderly and steady and uh, careful fashion. I worry about my own inadequacies and inabilities and I worry about the people around me. I've pondered about all the illnesses that I have seen, the deaths of friends, the temporary nature of our existence here 
and about how we really do need to take carefully um, and use the time carefully because it is extraordinarily valuable, the time we have here in mortality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiver. <clears throat> Along those same lines, I, I had a, a question thinking about mortality and with Gail referencing, um, you know, in terms of her understanding of reincarnation and then taking upon body until we until we get it right. And then she expounded on what that meant. But I just wonder um, if you can tell us what your thoughts are on the purpose of coming here into these physical bodies and, and what we're to be doing with our time that you were just mentioning it, that it's so precious. Uh, everyone here is to be added upon uh, as a result of what happens to us in mortality. And it doesn't matter if your life is short and brutal or if your life is long, everyone who comes into a mortal body in this sphere gets added upon. Um, we will depart here and we will go to a place where uh, there aren't bodies in this form, uh, where we'll be given a chance to think back upon what we experienced. And if it was harsh and brutal and short and mean, that will give us a chance to meditate upon the meaning of those things and why they are negative and why there ought to be something um, better. Uh, if your life is long and successful, you'll have a chance to reflect back upon what good you did, if any, and what more good you could have done, but you failed to do if you were self-indulgent. We, we are in the process of gaining uh, understanding, light and truth, and sometimes that comes at the expense of hurting others, and sometimes that comes at the value of helping others, but everything that goes on here will, will not be forfeited. It will be kept and we will move from, as the scriptures put it, worlds without end, from sphere to sphere, experience to experience, over whatever time it takes, however many lives it may take, in order to be added on so that we can become like what our scriptures define as the prototype of the saved man. That prototype of the saved man is Jesus Christ, because death could not hold him in the grave. The grave took him, and he reclaimed his body, and he ascended into heaven because he is the prototype of the saved man, and eventually we are to arrive at that same end, but it may take worlds without end. We're here along a long, long path, an eternal path, to gain experience while we are here temporarily and to learn. Thank you. Thank you so much for that last question, Denver. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, but before we um, end with our, our closing prayer from Joshua, I just wanted to say thank you so much again to all of our speakers who made the time and the effort to come here and be a part of this discussion um, about your walk in faith and the beauty that can be found in all the lives of God's children. Thank you for sharing with us the treasures from your spiritual path. I really appreciate y'all joining in the discussion. Uh, thank you also to all of the, the people who joined in live to watch. And I'd like to thank Brett and Adrian also for helping me with the Zoom. Um, just a reminder that this has been recorded and that it will be uploaded on YouTube and on restorationarchives.com uh, if you wanna share it or watch it again. And then I just wanted to do a quick mention here um, in 2020, during the Unity in Humanity Interfaith Celebration, we had a speaker, a, a cute little speaker, Sugopi Palakala, um, who talked about the Hare Krishna faith that she has. I just wanted to share here um, as a reminder <clears throat> that she has um, is, is a part of a weekly Zoom class to study the Bhagavad Gita um, with a Hare Krishna teacher. It's with her father. And it's every weekday on Wednesdays. Here's the times here. And there's the Zoom meeting ID and password if anyone wants to join in on that. Um, it's an excellent class where you get to learn some of those Eastern concepts that Joshua was um, kind of referencing with that mysticism. Um, I just wanted to share that real fast. And then I will bring it back over here to you, Joshua. 
Um, thank you for giving us the prayer. All right, thank you. I'm going to be reading a prayer. It's actually out of the Celtic Daily Prayer. Um, some of the ancient Celtic Church, I think, has some really cool wisdom for us as well. So, Creator, you've always given bread for the coming day. And though I am poor today, I believe. Creator, you've always given strength for the coming day. And though I am weak today, I believe. Creator, you have always given peace for the coming day. And though of ancient heart, today, I believe. Creator, you've always kept me safe in trials. And now, tired as I am, today, I believe. Lord, you have always marked the road for the coming day. And though it may be hidden, today, I believe. Creator, you've always lightened this darkness of mine. And though the night is here, today, I believe. Creator, You've always spoken when time was ripe, and though you be silent now, today I believe. See that ye at peace among yourself, my children. Love one another. Follow the example of good men of old, and God will comfort you and help you, both in this world and in the world to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Waddle, thank you everybody again, and blessings to, and peace to everyone. Thank you, Joshua, for that prayer. Okay, so that's it. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining in.